So welcome everybody. Uh, it's uh, the shock webinar that uh, is going to take place here in this virtual room. So it's about drama in the cloud, but uh, hopefully there will be no drama. And uh, well, we touch uh, the topic of the cloud and it feels very natural that we have a virtual meeting to discuss the cloud activities. Um, although of course we would very much like to see the audience and to have interaction with you. Uh, more than just uh, this virtual question and answering and some chit chat over coffee, but uh, we'll be um, telling you as much as we can and giving you an idea of uh, the work that uh, is going on. And please uh, be active in the chat saying uh, hello. And if you have any question and comments and uh, uh, we'll keep an eye on the chat and we'll be, uh, trying to be all over the place as much as we can in the virtual setup. So the title of our webinar is Shocking Drama in the Cloud. So the shock is the project that we are going to give you an overview uh, from. And uh, we are doing this work uh, as uh, within Clarin, been working in the uh, shock project. So the services are developed by Clarin and other partners uh, under the umbrella of shock. And uh, we talk about the details about the technology and give you an idea of um, what to tell to the researchers that would come to the library with the questions so that you have uh, um, a vision of uh, what information to provide. We give some technical details, but please don't be afraid of the technical details. Uh, th those are there just to give you an idea and there is always help and explanation and follow up if need be. So as an example, we'll be talking about encoding for theatrical text collections, but uh, in general, we uh, talk about all kinds of uh, language material. Uh, I think we can dive in now to the housekeeping notes. Uh, yes, hello everybody. I will co-host uh, this workshop today. I'm Yelena van der Leck from Clarin. So uh, please take note of uh, the following housekeeping notes. Um, the webinar is being recorded. All participants will receive a link to the recording later, later today. The slides today. will be available. Sorry, later in the two weeks. Later, <laughs> later <laughs> in the two weeks. Uh, the slides will also be shared with you. Um, and then um, we will provide, uh, the, if anybody needs a, a specific link from the slides, I'm going to quickly post it in the chat. And uh, if you have any questions, please use the chat uh, and I'll make sure that in the break, uh, some of the questions uh, uh, concerning the first part of the workshop will be addressed and answered. Okay, and since we have started to introduce uh, ourselves, so uh, well, Juliana uh, have already gave, provided her name and well, you can say what is your responsibilities in Clarin and Shock. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm the training and education officer, uh, supporting the clearing community with uh, training and educational activities. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maria Eskevich. I work as Clarin Eric Central Office Coordinator. And within Shock, uh, I'm the task leader of Task 3.3, which of course doesn't say anything to you if you're not in the project, but <laughs> the task itself is about um, looking at uh, how the text and uh, mining algorithms can uh, and tools can be used for uh, the researchers in social sciences and humanities and how those can be afterwards used uh, and accessed by the cloud. And I am okay. Francesca Frontini. Uh, I am a researcher at the Institute for Computational Linguistics in, uh, in Pisa in Italy, but I am here in my capacity of uh, uh, one of the directors of uh, Clarinetic. Uh, I am mostly involved in uh, user involvement in Cl within Clarin and I also uh, work uh, on uh, another subtask of the work package three, which is about multilingual vocabularies, but today I am more here in support of uh, Maria's uh, task. Wonderful, thank you. And now, uh, well, we have uh, quickly introduced ourselves and we would like to know more about you. So, Juliana, you can guide us. Yes, um, I've launched a small poll in, uh, in, the, in the Zoom. Directly in Zoom, uh, please. Uh, we would appreciate if you answered those three questions. So that you should be able to see them all on uh, your screens. Uh, yes, I see people uh, reacting, uh, answering the questions. Mm 
Okay. So, well, um, Ms. Juliana, you see how many answers uh, we have received. So you can maybe say a bit of, uh, give the overview of the answers that we uh, have. Yeah, so most, uh, most of the participants um, are, um, uh, they are part of libraries, they're working in libraries and archives, university and research performing institutions. A very small number, 8% are researchers and about 8% uh, they com uh, come from research infrastructures and EOSC uh, thematic clusters. Have you heard of research infrastructures in the social sciences and humanities? 81% uh, of the participants has, uh, answered yes, and a very small uh, number no. What is your experience with TI, uh, XML TI? 65% of the participants uh, have experience, uh, no, have no experience with uh, TI, 19%. Uh, a little bit of experience and 15%. So we, we have no very experienced participants. So basically uh, the, the, yeah, the experience level uh, will be improved after the workshop. Yes, that's exactly our goal. Although of course we are not teaching you the TI itself. We, are, we want to give you uh, more insights and uh, highlight the uh, value of this. Uh, uh, encoding oh, and now we all can see the uh, results of the poll on on the screens so i think okay. i will stop sharing now so that you can present the program thank you very much okay okay so uh to give you a bit of an overview of the structure of the tutorial that we have in mind so we start with welcome and introduction and um uh, first of all, Francesca will talk about Clarion Eric and what it offers, so what kind of tools and services there are, and here we'll have a lot of different links, and uh, uh, of course, if need be, we can share them in the chat, but uh, there is no hurry because everything is clickable and available further on in the slides in two weeks or so. Uh, we also give you afterwards, I give you the overview of the shock project. So what the project is about, who's involved and what's the value of that project for the librarian community. Afterwards, we uh, we'll go to more into more deep uh, details of the scenario of use and the motivation, <clears throat> why one would want to use DI, what's, uh, uh, what's there for, like when we have a researcher with the SSH research questions and some limited knowledge of TI that comes to a librarian who is aware of shock and clarion and what can happen after this interaction. Hopefully the knowledge that we give will help you to have a successful interaction about this topic. Uh, we'll give you some details about the TI and uh, well, afterwards, uh, hopefully uh, we'll have some questions from you that we can discuss. We'll have a quick uh, coffee break something like five minutes. And then uh, we'll go to the uh, use case. So that's one of the use cases that we work uh, uh, on in the shock project, just to show you how those things are being uh, used in practice um, and um, what kind of workflows you can uh, see happening. Afterwards, we have another round of question and answers. I mean, of course, they can be about uh, something about specific about the use case, or if you have more questions about uh, something that was told, uh, said in the previous parts. And we finish uh, with a few wrap up slides, uh, giving you uh, a number of useful references to the uh, details of events that are happening that could be of interest to you and uh, where which tools can be uh, found and so on. So now we can start and Francesca, now it's up to you. Thank you very much, Maria. So uh, although this uh, webinar is dedicated to SHOC services, it, uh, we decided to start with Clarin because SHOC is a cluster project which uh, groups together several research infrastructures. And so by <laughs> discovering Clarin, you will also understand maybe better what SHOC uh, actually is. So this brief overview will just give you an idea of the, some of the services that uh, Clarin Eric offers. But first of all, what is Clarin Eric? Clarin stands for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. Uh, for those of you, the 85% of you that are familiar with the research infrastructures, you will understand what uh, being an Eric is. It's a, it's a European Research Infrastructure Consortium. So Clarin is a legal entity. 
And uh, also since 2016, it is recognized with this landmark status, that is to say, it is a well-established uh, research infrastructure, which is already able to provide uh, services to uh, researchers. And what are these services? Uh, it is, first of all, uh, uh, easy and sustainable access to scholars in the humanities and social sciences and beyond, to digital language data, in written, spoken, video, or multimodal format, but also advanced tools to discover, explore, exploit, annotate, analyze, combine these resources wherever they are located. And also recently we've had it, added this, uh, this focus on also provided, uh, providing uh, knowledge, training, education by means of uh, webinars such as this and other uh, initiatives. And from a technical point of view, this is uh, the, the idea is to provide easy access to these resources to enable uh, their discovery and also when they are protected resources to ensure that they are accessible with a single sign on to no complications in this uh, respect, but also that we want to create this ecosystem for knowledge exchange. For those of you that have heard about the EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, uh, Clarin is integrated into the EOSC, and one of the ways in which it is integrating and co-constructing the EOSC is by participating to cluster projects such as SHOCK, and we will come back to that. So from the, I said that um, Clarin is a consort, uh, is a legal entity. It is in fact uh, a legal entity that is sustained by uh, the membership fees of countries that adhere to, uh, to, to, to Clarin. And uh, right now in this map, you can see that uh, there's a number of countries that have joined Clarin in Europe and uh, uh, even beyond. So uh, we have uh, South Africa as, a, as an observer. And then we have also um, centers that are located in countries that are not yet uh, part of, of the Clarin uh, consortium. But first and foremost, Clarin is a distributed infrastructure. So, it is actually built out of a series of uh, centers. Some of them are important. It is very important. They are data, data centers, certified data centers. That is to say, they store these resources and tools and they guarantee that they are accessible. And uh, we can proudly say that we cover a large number of languages and uh, offer tools also for many, many of them, and uh, that we offer resources not just in written, but in all modalities. We're not going to into the details of what Clarin, uh, what uh, all the resources that are in Clarin, but this slide is just to give you an idea of the, of the breadth of, uh, of uh, the areas and disciplines also that we cover and the data that we, that we offer. Um, so it's not just an infrastructure that covers research in linguistics, but cover, it covers all domains where language is a, a vehicle uh, in some sense. So I've talked about the technical infrastructure. Uh, this, this is not to go into the details, it's a very short uh, summarization of, of what the way in which it works. So you have this uh, series of uh, distributed centers these centers host the data and in some sense are guaranteeing also that they are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And because uh, the set of metadata that we use for to describe uh, these, these uh, data sets are uh, shared and uh, interoperable, it is possible to actually search for uh, these uh, resources from one single access point, which is the virtual language of what we will see how it works later on, so I'm not going to stop here too much. And at the same time, in some sense, it is also possible not only to uh, find resources from one single access point, but also to activate tools to process them also from, a, uh, from the Clarin Central Infrastructure by using the switchboard, which in some sense is a parallel to the VLO because it collects information about all the tools and web services that are made available by these distributed centers. So more concretely, here, and maybe Juliana can already uh, put the uh, link in the chat so people can also try out for themselves. Here is a screenshot from the Virtual Language Observatory. You can see that I have actually created a query. And uh, this is actually a query which uh, uses one of the facets, the facet collection. And it allows me to actually 
um, get all the data from one single collection, this, the Deutsche Text, Text Archive. Uh, and you can see here, uh, not the whole result, uh, all results, but you can see that uh, there is a series, for instance, of uh, digitized uh, newspapers that appear. Uh, uh, actually, where these uh, um, data uh, com are coming from is the page of the DTA, which is, as you can see, it's a different address, okay? So in some sense, because this, uh, this uh, archive is linked to Clary, you can actually search for uh, data from, uh, from them uh, by a central uh, access point, which uh, doesn't even require you to know that this data exists in some sense, because there's a lot of descriptors. I could have searched simply for newspaper texts in German and they would have appeared as well. So it gives a lot of visibility to these archives. And I, I, I haven't uh, chosen this example for nothing because, of course, uh, we have here we are here today in, uh, we, uh, talking to li librarians. So I assume that digitized collections of, uh, for instance, uh, in, um, historical documents is something that uh, also libraries generally offers. And, and in fact, uh, among the list of our um, many centers, we have uh, also some uh, libraries. And here I'm putting. Uh, two examples. First of all, the National Library of Norway, which is uh, uh, linked to Clarino, which is Clarin Norway, uh, and the um, Endangered Languages Archive. So uh, I said that it is also possible to process, activate uh, tools uh, from uh, the central infrastructure. And in fact, here I've taken this digitized uh, text. Uh, the project uh, has started with uh, 45 partners, beneficiaries, and uh, linked third parties, and uh, its overall duration is 40 months, so we are already past the uh, equator of the project, uh, so we actually have now, which means that we have not only objectives and goals, but we also have some implementation that we can share, some examples, or we can have more precise vision of what's going to be available in the short time. And uh, uh, there is a project uh, website, which of course has started with information about the project, the high level, but now there is more uh, valuable information that you can find there. So uh, if we can go for the next slide. Uh, so this is just to give you an idea of the partners. And I told you that we, we have started the project had 45 partners, but over the course of the first two years, uh, there were some more partners that um, brought their expertise or research questions uh, to, the, uh, to the table. So we actually have now more partners involved and uh, well, Libra is one of the partners and uh, uh, we cover, I think, all aspects of the field. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So that's uh, an overview of the expected uh, impact. So uh, the essentially the um, interaction of across the fields and the uh, uh, representation of the SSH in the uh, EOS uh, is envisaged via the creation, implementation, and of course the usage of the SSH open marketplace. So that's the platform that would encompass so different uh, uh, in research infrastructures and that will uh, make, uh, make possible the search for different uh, data tools and resources, some training material uh, at the same time across uh, different uh, repositories and different, um, of, uh, different offers provided by uh, different uh, research infrastructures and uh, their partners. Uh, so uh, as to the interesting parts of the webs of the shock website that you can find already and you can use already, it's uh, here, there is a screenshot of the uh, website and you can see that under the training category, there is the category called training events. And uh, that's the useful link for you because that's where you can uh, see what kind of events did take, uh, take place in the past. Like for example, recently there was a uh, workshop on the data citation 
and of course of the training events that will happen in the future and uh, as it is a best practice these days all the events are recorded so the materials can be accessed uh, even if uh, you are uh, getting to know about this project and this information only now you can uh, connect and see uh, the videos and get more information about what happened in the past can I go to the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. So I also did some search on the website to give you an insight on, on what is there, for example, for librarians. And you can see that you can find some reports and some uh, training material. And on the next slide, uh, we have the uh, more zooming in, uh, into the training in the sense that uh, there is uh, the SSH training discovery toolkit. So you can actually uh, look for search, not overall on what, what is on the website, but specifically on the training materials. And again, if you look for the training material that was mentioning, sorry, I was still, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Francesca. Uh, so the, if you look for what is there for librarians, you can see uh, there is a number of uh, training kits and workshops that you can check uh, for uh, more information. Now the next one. So the SSH Open Marketplace is it's a discovery portal, uh, and um, it's um, con three main concepts that uh, we focus in and we uh, uh, invest our time in is the contextualization, the curation, and the community, so that we are uh, trying to engage with all communities and see what is valuable for them, what is needed for them, so that we curate the uh, data that and resources and tools that uh, are useful for their uh, work. And uh, there is a better version now, so uh, you can already uh, browse to. And there are a few screenshots on the following up slides uh, with uh, what you can find there. So uh, there is some training material, um, that uh, can be uh, found and uh, also uh, the next slide there are also the workflows so while the training material is more of uh, well there are some modules and there is some uh, toolkits but the workflows is uh, something that um, we envisage could help the researchers to get an example to see how uh, the other researchers have used certain tools or how they looked at certain research questions and how they reformulated those research questions from the uh, general uh, question to some precise steps of what has to be done actually, uh, how the data has to be processed. And those workflows or the pipelines um, are on the website. So here there's a screenshot of uh, my search for the TI uh, related workflows. And uh, of course, as I said, we are uh, populating the marketplace, so there will be more material, but that's to give you an idea what is there to find. And the next slide. So now Francesca is for you. Yes. Uh, so uh, just a very quick, int quick introduction into uh, the scenario that we have chosen for today's uh, workshop uh, webinar, uh, which is uh, linked to drama or theatrical uh, plays. Um, so in this slide, of course, you see uh, on, the, on the right hand, it's an uh, English and French edition of the works of, of Moriere. And uh, here I just put two among the many uh, research, research uh, uh, researchers that are linked uh, to one specific question, that is to say, the study of theatrical characterization or um, more simply said, how is it that uh, uh, playwrights uh, create characters that become memorable, that uh, are actually, actually distinctive? How do they give them a voice? And one way to address this question has been also to use, uh, to utilize uh, um, techno te technologies that come from uh, uh, computational linguistics or uh, uh, digital uh, literary studies, that is to say, to uh, analyze, uh, process the text. And uh, for instance, here I uh, cited uh, my, my own work, but also work from uh, colleagues uh, such as Joanna Galeron, etc. So how do does, and these types of research, they start all from one place? Uh, that is to say, uh, you need 
quality digital sources and uh, uh, they need to be uh, if possible richly encoded because you need to have metadata at text level so to, to know about the author the year of publication maybe the list of characters that uh, are uh, included and also you need a notation at uh, at uh, sentence level so to say at least that is to say you should be able to identify the lines that uh, are uh, uh, from one character to the other so why? Because then when you have this, you can create separate subcorpora for uh, each character. And not only that, so you can, for instance, study one character with respect to all the others, uh, but maybe you can also start, uh, start asking questions about uh, the uh, uh, certain characters, certain typologies of characters with respect to others, for instance, the servants versus the masters, the women or the men, etc. So once you have this, what you can then do is to use these computational tools to explore, enrich, analyze these texts, and then maybe let's say uh, some, some patterns and some uh, motives emerge that are characterizing certain characters with respect to others. Now, what uh, can uh, librarians do and how can infrastructures help them in this, uh, uh, knowing that sometimes not all researchers have all the technical knowledge that, that is uh, necessary to carry out themselves at these operations. And this is what we are trying to show you. So uh, we will, uh, first of all, show you what tools are out there to look for texts that are already digitized. And uh, I've already talked about the Clarin DLO. And here, for instance, I have uh, searched for uh, Hamlet and found uh, two uh, instances of, uh, of this uh, dig of digital uh, versions of this, this text, which are actually um, available here. You can see uh, with rich, rich metadata uh, in digital uh, format. And they are actually offered by one of the client centers, uh, that is to say the Oxford Text, and text Archive. Um, and that what you can do actually here is, as I said, also to process them with the switchboard. So you can take this text and you can uh, see what tools are out there to, to process it. So you can uh, linguistically analyze this text. This would allow you, for instance, to ask questions uh, such as how many adjectives or how many uh, verbs are used uh, uh, in certain plays with respect to others, etc. Or, as I said before, you can also explore, use tools to explore uh, uh, the, the texts uh, visually. However, uh, things are not uh, always as smooth <laughs> as uh, they could be. And this is, uh, uh, this is an example. So if you take this, uh, uh, this uh, text and you do the, the same steps that I have done, uh, shown you from the slides, you will end up to, with the fact that uh, this Hamlet text contains a lot of ham. <laughs> Why? Because in fact, uh, one of the most cited words is ham, because in, if you take a look at the concordance list here, you will see that uh, there is actually some um, encoding of sort here that, uh, that is used to, to, to showcase that certain lines are uh, by Hamlet. And uh, this uh, is not detected uh, by uh, Voyant, which is the tool that uh, I use to, to, to analyze it. That is to say that uh, tools and resources should be uh, able uh, to work together. So they should be compatible. And in particular, the encoding that is used in the text should be compatible with what the uh, tools offer. So, uh, the input format matters, and uh, uh, you need to be able to uh, to to make to avail yourself of it. And this is what brings us to the issue of TEI, which Maria will uh, discuss right now. Okay, thank you. So we don't talk much about food, but the actual <laughs> the encoding uh, text encoding uh, initiative. So. Uh, Again, uh, we point to, to the fact that there are some uh, short workflows already on the marketplace uh, where you can see how you can create a TI based uh, corpus. And uh, let me go to the next slide. 
yeah then we also find the material in the DLO as uh, Francesco was saying so uh, we look for, uh, for for the material that is relevant for us and um, uh, we check whether the metadata is available there uh, but it's not only VLO there are also other sources that you can find by, by VLO but also some other archives uh, I think we have it on the next slide when uh, uh, there is, for example, this drama corpora, and uh, there are uh, those are the uh, already annotated, uh, properly annotated the TI uh, details <clears throat> corpora in many languages, so that you can point the researchers for if they want to look into some particular uh, language and some cor drama corpora in particular language, and you can see what's uh, the overview of the material that is available. And uh, of course, there are much more places uh, like uh, Observatoire de la Ville Littéraire. Well, its uh, uh, res res uh, sources are multiple, but essentially we get to the TI uh, index date, uh, document itself. And uh, on the next uh, slide, uh, yeah, we have also, well, that's once again, we are uh, pointing to the relevant publications that can be also find via, found via, for example, um, shock marketplace. We have this uh, type of uh, information there. And then on the next slide, yeah. So that's uh, the, um, uh, the, the website that those of you who are familiar with TI has prob have probably seen it. And if not, that's a very useful uh, website to go to if you want to get more insights into all the details of structure of uh, the uh, um, development of this initiative. And I would say that uh, the most interesting uh, material is in this uh, little column, the text body so that's where the, there is a, there are all kinds of uh, descriptions of what the TI uh, infrastructure is of like what is uh, in the files and what type of uh, um, uh, what what type of metadata you can expect or uh, to be in the files or what you, what you could be looking for and uh, if you are creating uh, the corporal what kind of uh, encoding you want to uh, or you can uh, make into the files you're working with and uh, to give you a bit of an idea how the uh, files are looking um, looking like so the default structure of the ti file it would have a header and then the uh, material of the text itself and there there can be uh, more than one uh, body of text if there are different uh, sections in the file and uh, it's uh, um, this encoding also reminds a lot to the html uh, pages that i think everybody has seen once in a while that uh, you have to head over the information about uh, where the information is coming from and then the actual information uh, of the, uh, of the file. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we have this minimal recommended header. So that's uh, the bare minimum of the information that you would expect to see. It's at least, of course, the title and uh, uh, who did compile this text, how, what was the name of the person and then where this publication comes from. So some bibliographic references. So that's the... Uh, so if you have access to a file, that's information to check if you want to uh, see more details about the file that you have at hand. And uh, in terms of the body of the text, you can just to highlight what kind of interesting um, indication that there uh, can be once the uh, corporate text is uh, well annotated. So for example, you can have names, dates, people, places. So you can see that there is a sentence uh, about the David Paul Brown and what has happened to him. And then there is a um, text and saying that that's a name and it's a person and it's a politician that plays a role. Or otherwise the names can be the names of the place and the relevant abbreviations, like in the case of the Citro in France. And of course the dates also can be marked and uh, also the uh, there can be a combination of the text like a place name so it's not only a location but it's also uh, a location and some uh, period in time so it's 
the details of these tags can, could, can be, uh, so the, the tags can be very detailed. And uh, once you have checked what kind of tags you have in the text, you can uh, think about how to process them uh, automatically on the large scale using some scripts. Okay, and the next one. So uh, to get more information about the TI itself, uh, as I said, so there are these uh, TI guidelines, the, the website that uh, the screenshot that we had early on. And then there are also tutorials uh, from uh, that ASTG. And there are uh, trade, full trading models, modules that you can follow to uh, get uh, like deep dive um, impression. And you can also have some uh, video uh, introduction, uh, say on the YouTube. So that's the type of uh, material that can be uh, helpful to get more insights and more uh, detailed information. So uh, I think uh, we are now at the first moment of uh, opening up the floor and checking the chat whether you had some questions uh but i think uh yes, we didn't can, have no i don't see any questions in the chat uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask uh, your questions no questions everything has been clear so far or everybody has gone uh, to use the link that we have provided and is <laughs> exploring what the language observatory has because it has quite so many facets. Uh, All clear, thank okay. you. Okay. It is very clear. Yes, thank you <laughs> for confirming. Maybe we can ask a question ourselves. Uh, it would be interesting to yes. know how many, I mean, some of you, many of you will work probably in, a, in a, and we have a digital libraries uh, in, in their institutions. And uh, I would be curious to know uh, how many of you are hosting the TEI uh, collections. Or how many of you are aware that you are hosting those collections? Or maybe another question would be if there are, ah, okay. You have uh, one answer. I know that we do at the University of Cambridge, but I personally don't work in that area, says uh, Niang to Melty. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we will check this out then. Okay. Yeah, and I was thinking about another question. How often does it happen that the researchers come to you with those questions uh, or with the data or if they stumble upon this data and have questions about how to use it. So if that happened. Well, if it hasn't happened so far, we hope that there will be more often. Yes, uh, Elisa from the University of Am uh, from VU, Amsterdam says that we have an active group of linguists, so I'm expecting those questions soon. And uh, Charlotte says that we do at the library as well, but again, I do not work in that area. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> or... And then at the Münster, Germany, we host an online edition of the works of Jonathan Swift. And um, Viola has shared an, a link in the, in the chat with everybody. Please feel free to unmute yourself, uh, because otherwise it's so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, um, Francesca Maria, for the audience? If not, then, um, oh yes, we have some. Another comment from Viola, the SWIFT project team has given an introduction to TI to us at the library. And Orna Roche 
Uh, she says that at University College Dublin, a digital library, we have some TI, such as the letters of Nano Nagle. And she shares the link. Yeah, letters are also, I mean, um, today we are talking about uh, uh, the standard TI encoding of, of, uh, of plays, but the letters are also um, a, more, a jar uh, that requires a lot of encoding in, in terms of TI, but then it allows uh, a lot of, uh, of interesting things, for instance, uh, because it's encoding in a very clear standardized way, for instance, the recipient, uh, uh, the, the writer. Uh, there are a lot of projects that are based on TI and that create, uh, for instance, networks of, of correspondences. And uh, uh, you can see there, uh, this is a, a genre that uh, allows you to see the power of uh, highly encoded encoded texts, uh, uh, as well as uh, the example that we are giving, providing today. Any other questions, remarks? Otherwise, do we proceed with the coffee break, Maria? And just come? Yeah, I think. Yes. Okay, so uh, I suggest we have five minutes break. Um, it's actually 10 minutes before. So uh, 2.30, Maria? Yes. That's yes? Good. Okay, let's, let's start uh, at 2.30. Okay, then see you in a few minutes. Yes. Ah, okay. All prints. <laughs> yeah, no. okay. Thanks. See you in a, in a few minutes. Two thirty on my clock. Do we have? Oh, wait a second. Okay. Do we have the audience back from the break? As I'm sharing the screen, I will see. I think I can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so. We continue now with uh, an example that uh, we are working uh, with uh, with our partners at the University of Göttingen and uh, at the uh, Claren Lindat node at the Charles University of Prague. So this is the use case that uh, we work with uh, within the shock project. And that's um, with this following slide, we would like to give you an idea of what kind of workflows there are in a sense that uh, uh, the researchers they start with some questions and then they find the, the text the, the text that are encoded in uh, ti and then what they can do and uh, would like uh, the technical skills i mean of course it's uh, the, the more tech savvy you are the better but it can be also uh, you are well supported with such uh, tools as the workflows because most of the scripts are already prepared for you. And uh, uh, first of all, you can uh, simply run the uh, scripts on the data that you have. If you want to uh, see some, if you want to fulfill the same task or I mean, further on, you can look into, okay, maybe you need to edit something, but that uh, that is easier to start with uh, having an example. Um, at hand. So the example that we are, sorry, yeah, bit of the drama, how the slides are jumping. So the example that uh, we are working uh, uh, with, it's the inter intertextuality phenomenon in European drama history. And uh, to give you some context, well, what we are um, looking at and why. Uh, in the 16th, 17th century, um, and those were the times of the most that were the most productive times in the history of theater. And productivity means that there were a large bodies of text that uh, were written in different languages, and uh, uh, that means that there is a lot of material that researchers can uh, look into, and uh, this material is in uh, different uh, languages. And uh, what is there? Uh, as an example, what could be interesting is like, for example, to look at the 
certain characters, that the type of the characters, like for example, the servants or versus the masters. Why is it interesting? Because the uh, representative of certain uh, class, so those characters were used and uh, not only to just be part of the um, play, but they were they had the function to unveil certain uh, order of discourse, and they would uh, incorporate certain wisdom of the time. Uh, that uh, is interesting for the researchers to look into, and you can uh, do comparative literary analysis uh, and. Uh, you can analyze the literary, uh, literary language of individual dramas of uh, respective historical uh, language level and uh, respective uh, periods of time and in uh, respective countries. And you can uh, compare uh, how certain things, you know, certain wisdoms were expressed in uh, one country versus another, in one language versus another. Uh, of course, that's the re researcher context. So that's what uh, uh, the scholars uh, have in mind, but uh, what is um, actually, uh, what, what, what they're confronted with, what kind of challenges they uh, have when they start this work, of course, it's the volume of the material, because uh, you can work with one or two plays and do some manual uh, analysis, but it's not feasible to do manually the uh, analysis of um, large scale uh, corpora. Um, and it's more interesting, gives you more insights when you have uh, such an overview of and more context. Uh, also you have to work with uh, multiple languages uh, that uh, this corpora contain. And uh, also uh, the annotations are, uh, well, sometimes present, sometimes uh, it's not fully annotated. So, uh, you want to work with the encoded text that would have uh, as much of those details. And when um, the researcher starts, uh, this, the assistant scholar starts with, uh, to work with this data, they have to reformulate this uh, qu research question into more uh, digital humanities, so it's more of the digital uh, aspects and context. So um, that uh, this question can be seen as, uh, okay, so can those relationships between the characters be somehow quantitatively recorded and uh, um, uh, discerned from the uh, material and whether those recurring, there are some recurring patterns that can be seen and that can be detected uh, using the tools. Uh, and, okay, yeah, so uh, what we uh, worked uh, work with in the in our task uh, is the three languages, as I already said. So we look at the dramas from the Shakespeare Library in English, uh, the Théâtre Classique uh, by Paul Thievre in French, and the dramas from uh, Pedro Calderón de la Barca from in Spanish. And uh, uh, the material uh, that can be found uh, by uh, different uh, sources, so by Vielo or uh, we we're also pointing to this uh, Dracor um, repository. So we take uh, those plays, different uh, materials, and of course they're not only the materials in different languages, but um, the uh, encoding sometimes is uh, different. So what we um, experience when we once we found all the material that we work with and downloaded it that there are uh, there's inconsistency of available formats so uh, what you might experience that there is a, a ti xml but it's not valid against the schema so you have to either uh, look into the files and fix the uh, encoding or you need to discard uh, this uh, this part of the corporate as uh, something that you would not work with uh, sometimes it is encoded with proprietary formats, so you need to check whether uh, that's something, uh, as Francesco was given an example of the ham, so that's if it's uh, persistent to the whole corpora and you can cl uh, easily clean the corpora, or uh, whether that's something that uh, you have to keep in mind. And also uh, some parts of material could be available only as plain text, but then of course for the uh, TI processing of the large scale, you need to either uh, process, uh, so either prepare the encoding for those files or 
uh, discarded uh, for the moment. Um, so we, uh, in order to uh, normalize the corpora that we're working with, uh, we uh, did some cleanup and uh, there are different uh, Python scripts just uh, to clean up those different parts of the corpus. And of course, we also itemize the parts that can be taken into experience and not due to uh, the encoding uh, issues. So uh, what's, uh, the, what's the first step that uh, we need to do before processing uh, the text? So the idea is that we have the um, dramas, like for example, here is the beginning of the Midsummer uh, Night's, Night's Dream. And in the drama, you have different characters uh, talking to each other. And uh, this is annotated as uh, different uh, entries. But if you want to uh, look into the uh, language that is used by a particular uh, character, we need to have a, say, a file or uh, one place where uh, all the speeches by this character are uh, stored and not um, uh, so and, and there is no interruption by the other characters. So essentially, we want to have uh, for this one uh, one uh, file on the left, we want to have uh, a number of files with each character's material. Because afterwards, we can, uh, say, upload this text file uh, to something like Voyant to see uh, uh, some statistics over the text and visualize uh, the keywords, etc. Uh, and in order to do that, so we start, as I said, with the uh, text uh, that is, so the uh, encoded uh, files. And here you can see an example of actual uh, TI encoded file, because uh, in the previous slides we had some minimum information and just an examples, but it's a very uh, long file. And But here you can see the header with the title and the authors so of the information about uh, encoding. And then down the uh, down uh, in the file. Sorry for the jumping. I have to be very careful with the <clears throat> strokes. Uh, we uh, we can see the speech of the character, but you can see that each word is um, uh, having its own uh, set of tags. So uh, what we do is that we need to uh, go through the workflow of processing uh, the corpus of this uh, TI uh, files uh, and uh, with the goal to have the set of uh, individual text for each character. So we go through uh, a number of steps. And here I give you an example of the workflow as I was saying. So that is uh, written in a quite technical way because of course the, uh, you need to know which, termin uh, which terminal comments to run or um, what uh, to do with the file, but at the same time, uh, I want to uh, let, get, get you to understand that uh, the actual work is done by the script, so it's not, uh, it should not be scary neither for the researchers nor for any librarian to point the researchers to uh, this kind of workflows. So uh, when we start, so as the first step, uh, so we need to count the number of these persons that are in the same list of uh, persons in the each drama and store this result in the, uh, some plain text file. And for that, uh, you can run a, a comment in the terminal and uh, in the workflow, uh, such comment is provided. So uh, what I'm showing here is the actual, uh, Material that you find when you say go on the uh, marketplace and look for the uh, for this uh, workflow, and uh, so you get uh, as a first step you have this uh, number of uh, the characters in each drama uh, counted, and then uh, you need to do like as a second step something quite simple that uh, doesn't really require you even using the terminal because if you need to move. Uh, like two files from one directory to another, you can also do that uh, easily um, just uh, using any of the uh, tools on your machine. And uh, then uh, because the scripts are written in Python, so you need to turn all the virtual Python environments so that you need to uh, check this uh, on your machine and uh, there are instructions for, uh, say, if you run it on Windows machine or uh, if you need to do that um, by the terminal. 
and then the actual work so the actual um, uh, uh, so the actual extraction of information of those uh, uh, texts that are associated with different uh, characters is uh, done via running one comment uh, that is uh, uh, written uh, in the workflow and so that you can uh, simply copy paste. And essentially that script is written in the way that it does take the files uh, and create the, for every, um, drama a subdirectory which has each individual files with the uh, characters um, speech, uh, speeches in it so essentially that uh, that is done quite quickly and uh, thanks for the so ti information in the uh, corpora you have this uh, uh, all properly um, so you can extract this information and you can then uh, properly store it so uh, the uh, task is fulfilled, but um, in the workflow, that that's not the last step because um, uh, first the researchers that develop, uh, um, so that work with the data, they uh, know what is in the data, they check it. But the idea is that when the workflow is shared with the other researchers, there's also information on how to uh, test uh, whether uh, that wh whether when you have run the uh, script uh, or uh, the set of uh, steps on your machine with your data, whether uh, you actually received, so whether you have got the uh, exact uh, result that you were uh, expected uh, to, that you were expecting to uh, get to. And for that, there are a few more steps so that uh, you, you need to actually yeah, count the number of the single files in every directory and uh, uh, store it uh, in a separate file. And again, of course, you don't do it uh, by hand. So you don't go to each folder and check. So there is a, uh, one uh, um, line of uh, the, that you can write in the, write in the terminal and uh, this information will be stored and uh, uh, you need to uh, say restructure the every entry in a uh, uh, slightly different way again by using the uh, script as like it's uh, uh, step seven so you need to run the script and that will do the restructuring of the file for you and uh, then some polishing of these files has to happen because uh, when the script is run, uh, the paths to the files that you are creating that are on your machine that are saved in the uh, files that you're working with. Uh, so they, those paths need to be removed. But again, that happens uh, as you run the um, specially created script for that. And um, uh, you, uh, so essentially you run, uh, you go through the steps of uh, moving the information from uh, one uh, table to another, uh, running the script, and uh, that um, uh, gives you uh, the uh, statistics of the files that you have created, uh, about the characters in every file, about the, the number of the uh, characters in the play, and um, uh, as the uh, one of the last steps. So you have to create the file where uh, you will uh, have the information, the output of uh, this uh, preparatory steps. And uh, the last script to run is uh, the uh, checkup script. So the script to that is needed to check whether uh, what um, you have done on your machine with your data, whether it has provided the results that uh, you were looking at. So uh, the script gives you an, a number of errors, if there are any. I mean, of course, uh, you hope not to have any, but uh, if something was wrong with the uh, files uh, in the beginning, that could, uh, of course, cause the issues. And um, uh, the information is uh, uh, structured in the uh, output file that gives you uh, any details of the errors. And uh, essentially, uh, once you do this checkup on your machine, you know that, okay, you, you've gone through the workflow that was uh, prepared by the other researchers, and then you've received, uh, so you, you've got to the um, 
certain files that uh, you were envisaging to uh, uh, have. And then you can uh, follow up by processing, uh, say, this text with uh, other uh, tools that um, are suitable for uh, further text analysis that uh, you have for the research questions. Uh, so essentially, if you want to, to summarize those steps that need to be taken by an SSH researcher, is that first you need to get the annotated data, which you do uh, via uh, one of the aggregators that are available. So it can be VLO, it can be, if you uh, look for more of the uh, language uh, data and uh, but if uh, in the task and the research question I mean, here we were talking about drama focus but uh, you might have a, you might talk to the researcher who has more uh, of the social sciences uh, context so uh, uh, then the search on the SSH open marketplace would be uh, uh, giving you a broader context and uh, broader potential sources of information. So uh, you download these material from the original source, so you get the uh, data collection. Then uh, you can find the workflows with scripts, processing examples, and the competitive tools. Compatible tools. Uh, this uh, can be done by SSH Open Marketplace, and you will have the work uh, workflows written in details as I was uh, showing in the previous slides where essentially you just need to copy certain things and run, move the files and then uh, run the script that is already provided. Or uh, another approach can be that you also uh, finding the compatible tools in the Clarin um, uh, language resources switchboard and so that you can uh, run the uh, processing in the browser and see uh, the uh, results of the uh, analysis. Uh, so uh, yeah, essentially that uh, the when you have a uh, workflow, this is going to be the offline work because you follow the instructions provided and you run the scripts on your machine. And uh, the scripts themselves, they can be downloaded because the, in the workflow, there is reference to the scripts uh, um, on the GitHub. Uh, as one of the places where they can be stored. Or uh, if you use uh, language resources switchboard, it can be uh, done uh, online. So uh, now there is another uh, slot uh, for some questions and answer. And as I'm sharing the screen, I am not really sure how many of if there's any questions or comments in the audience no uh, there are no questions in the chat um please feel free to to unmute yourself and uh, ask your questions directly Yeah, so maybe actually we have a question to you in the sense that uh, when we think about workflows description uh, coming from the technical uh, side, so we know what to write in terms of uh, which line of code to, uh, you know, which uh, to put in the terminal or uh, which uh, script or environment it should be, but uh, it would be valuable for us to know um, what kind of descriptions do you, like how, how more detailed and how more, what would be more user-friendly way to, uh, to put this, uh, such a workflow uh, so that you think that you'd be more, like a librarian would be more comfortable to recommend uh, this uh, workflows usage, or you think that the researchers that you are working with would be, um, more comfortable to also work uh, with afterwards. I mean, if you don't have it, the, the exact uh, suggestion uh, now, we would be happy to hear anything in the follow up if you have some thoughts afterwards. Uh, that's. Totally fine as well. 
Uh, perhaps one thing from from my perspective, I I can't really speak for uh, for other people, but um, I was already wondering like if you find this workflow and you realize as research that you just want to do something a little bit different than the code that is provided, then how would you find a solution to like tweak the to to tweak the right part of the code? And I guess for me, it would be interesting to see if there's perhaps some extra training that gives you more explanation about different aspects of a Python code, but perhaps they are already there, I don't really know for sure. Or perhaps that you have an environment where you can just uh, zoom over the code and per part of the code, it is explained what it, what it, what it is doing or something. That would be my uh, input. Or... Okay, thanks. Well, uh, I think for uh, the scripts that we are working with, well, we can indicate which section of the code uh, are indeed um, to be changed if you want to add it. Um, okay, well, I think we need to, about this. We need to talk to the developers. Uh, uh, maybe I can add the fact that uh, now um, some technologies within the Python ecosystem are available, for instance, a Jupyter notebooks um, that are doing exactly this, that is to say uh, they are providing the code, but also the, there's a possibility to insert text and explanations and to run each part of the code in an interactive separate, um, and separate way. So uh, this is very pedagogical and uh, it may resemble also to some in some way to to our workflow or could be used to create workflows so this is also yeah so we'll have to explore whether we can add also say the jupyter notebooks to such workflow description of the marketplace okay thank you very much you're welcome Any other comments or questions? Maria, somebody is asking um, Elisa from VU Amsterdam. How can researchers contribute to uh, LRS, write a Python code that others can reuse, for example? Do they need to declare members? We, um, maybe Elisa can clarify a question a little bit because it is possible to deposit language resources, right, Maria? I'm um, sorry, I, uh, I, I made a mistake in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in my question. Uh, what I was wondering is you, re you referenced all of these Python scripts uh, that researchers can use to, um, to, uh, to, to encode the, the, the language resources. Um, but is it possible for researchers to also contribute to this kind of thing? Uh, because at my university, there's, a, there's quite an active group of uh, uh, language, uh, uh, language research and, and linguistics and computational linguistics. And I think many of them probably already are contributing, but I think many of them would like to contribute in a way. Uh, is this possible? Uh, well, Francesca, did you want to... I, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, you can, uh, uh, I mean, uh, something that I haven't said uh, in, in uh, my presentation, but uh, uh, as I, I just touched upon the fact that Clarin is, is a sort of federation of data centers. So uh, one way to share your data, uh, whether when, when we talk about language resources, we also include the code or the tools. So you can share your resource language resources by depositing them in one of the Clarin uh, data centers. Uh, yeah. And this will make them automatically available uh, and searchable uh, to the whole community. Uh, then the, talking about tools or scripts uh, for, for data is uh, or like for instance, corporates are uh, rather simple, but uh, for scripts, uh, what you may want to do is to create maybe a web service around it so that it uh, can be used from a web interface, et cetera. And in this sense, some at least of the planning centers can also be of use. So if uh, you feel that uh, your uh, researchers have some very powerful, useful tool um, scripts that could be turned into a tool, then they can address a planning center. And which planning center to address, I think, it depends on, uh, uh, I mean, 
normally one goes to the clarin B centers, so the centers that offer more tools and services uh, within their own uh, national, uh, within their, their country, so the national center, so to say. I don't okay. know if you wanted to add something. Well, I also wanted to say that uh, for the um, marketplace, it will be also, well, currently it's not open yet to public, but it will be also possible to add those workflows uh, descriptions so um, it will be also possible so that if you store your scripts already uh, in some uh, place because uh, the marketplace itself is not the storage space um, but then you can uh, have this description of how the data was processed and uh, have it in the uh, marketplace so then it will be also having this visibility all right, thanks. That's that's great. Thanks for your uh, responses. Welcome. Do we have any other comments or questions? It's much easier when you are in the room and seeing the faces rather than when you're sharing the screen and being in the blind. Okay, well, if you have uh, more uh, questions uh, to the end of the uh, presentation, we of course can have another round of uh, answers. Um, now uh, we have, okay, now we have the uh, wrap up uh, overview and uh, we would like to highlight the especially useful references that we already mentioned in the beginning, but uh, also some particular pointers that can help you uh, to get more information on particular aspects uh, that we have um, talked about. So uh, in terms of, uh, first of all, well, the take home message that we would like you uh, to have after uh, this session is that well, collaboration with research infrastructures is valuable for both researchers and librarians to support the researchers. So we are there, we are working for you essentially. So, uh, well, we are open for questions, comments, and uh, uh, we can uh, see what kind, uh, what kind of node can, has enough knowledge and can provide you with the information you need. The tools, resources, services, and various teaching material can be found via such aggregations as um, well, SSH Open Marketplace, and then uh, for the language tools of researchers in the domain of SSH, the Virtual Language Observatory is the place to start looking for um, all of those. And uh, um, the, well, the, we know that some of you have uh, encountered TI before, but we would like to highlight it yet again that it's a, a powerful annotation scheme for information extraction, and uh, it helps with advanced analysis that uh, um, you can envisage when uh, working with the data. Um, this is a shock event, and there will be more shock events and workshops in the future as the project is uh, ongoing. So first of all, shock is uh, represented at Liber. Uh, well, unfortunately, one of the uh, uh, events, uh, one of the presentations has happened before our workshop, but I'm sure since uh, something like in two weeks, uh, there will be the recordings of all the materials. So if you are interested, you can uh, listen to the data citation for the humanities and social sciences. Um, then uh, later this week, tomorrow, there will be a poster uh, get, giving more details about the marketplace. Uh, that's tomorrow at the session between, between 12.30 and uh, 1. And you can already uh, see the poster content and the video recording of it on the uh, Libra website. Uh, all future shock events are, well, future and past ones are uh, can be found on the uh, website. And uh, we would like to highlight to you that uh, there will be the um, Shock Vocabulary Initiative already on the upcoming Monday uh, at the ICTESH conference. So it's uh, yet another conference that happens in the virtual format. So the registration is open. 
and uh, that would be uh, an interesting topic for the librarians to uh, listen to. Uh, plus, uh, further in autumn 2021, uh, it's not a precise date yet, but uh, we already know the topics that uh, uh, the um, of the upcoming events. There will be a, a workshop on data protection and the GDPR, and there will be another webinar on the data citation. Uh, so that you can get more information. Uh, and then uh, Francesca can uh, give you some more uh, references for the uh, Clarin uh, search infrastructure. Yeah, so uh, from the Clarin side, what you need to take home is apart from the fact that, of course, uh, there are these services uh, that can be used uh, uh, to search and find the resources. The, the important uh, take home message is also that uh, there is a network of uh, knowledge centers uh, that can also function as help desks. So uh, do not hesitate to contact the relevant ones or to point uh, researchers into the direction of, of uh, these uh, knowledge centers. Um, maybe uh, Juliana can uh, put the link to the knowledge centers page in the in the chat if she hasn't already. Uh, you will see that there is a search function, so you, you can actually search by topics uh, and find the right one for you. Um, and now other ways uh, to, to get to know uh, more about Clarin is to uh, participate in uh, our events. Uh, so uh, the annual conference is open uh, to all researchers that uh, may uh, submit uh, contributions that are of interest uh, to Clarin. And uh, uh, we also support in normal times, uh, we support uh, mobility by providing uh, mobility grants for researchers to visit from Clarin uh, state member states to visit other centers in different uh, countries, for instance, especially young researchers. They can avail themselves of, of this possibility uh, now that we will be all full, fully vaccinated and with uh, whatever pass it's called. Uh, then uh, we can also uh, start hopefully funding again uh, support for workshops in, in face to face workshops, not just uh, <laughs> like these ones. And uh, we also have an ambassadors network. Uh, there will be new ambassadors nominated uh, soon, so they may also organize something for you, to, for your communities. And uh, we have uh, uh, training through live events uh, or, or webinars, uh, not only for, um, actually not only for researchers, but also for developers, uh, maybe data librarians, etc. In particular, you see that we have all these activities on data citation. Because, and you, I think you, well, you, you know this better than, than we do. I mean, we, er, earlier on, uh, librarians would uh, just recommend books, uh, literature, or first uh, uh, secondary literature, etc. But nowadays, there's a, this whole palette of, of things that, that researchers use and that they need to cite uh, data, code, uh, even workflows can be cited. So all these uh, uh, things need to be credited and how do we cite them properly? And there's a lot of research going on around that. That's, uh, and we need the input of librarians uh, for, for it. So uh, yeah, check out all our possibilities. They are listed on the client web page. Uh, next, yeah. And uh, practically you can subscribe to the news flash uh, Clarin News Flash. Uh, check our uh, past and future events and all the open calls that I've uh, I've mentioned, and the photos that uh, that are on Twitter. You can follow us uh, as well. I think that, that's all. And um, more specifically, you can check out uh, um, our, our Clarin. Uh, so for the time being, while we are waiting for the pandemic to be over, really over. Uh, we have all these virtual events that you're very welcome to. Uh, we have the uh, Clarin Cafes that are short webinars that you can attend um, online and we've recorded them so you can check out all the past uh, webinars. Um, so coming up also there's um, uh, an event uh, that is part of the App Skills uh, Erasmus Plus project. Uh, you can ask Juliana if you know, want to know more about this project. It's called Every Time I Hire, hire a Linguist. 
and it's uh, actually dedicated to uh, emergent tech profiles for linguists, translators, and language experts. So if you have students that are in the in applied linguistics, you may want to recommend this, uh, this webinar to them. In, as a cafe, in the cafe series, we have a cafe uh, next Monday dedicated to the Parliament project. So we launch uh, 17 uh, cor uh, uh, corpus uh, of 17 parallel uh, parliamentary uh, corpora that can be uh, accessed and uh, studied uh, uh, in a comparative way. And if you want to know more about how they were created and what you can do with them, this is the opportunity. And then uh, our next conference also, unfortunately, like the previous one, will be held online. But the good side is that uh, we have a lot of attendance because of the uh, online conference. So of course, this is also open to, to you and to anyone that may be uh, interested. And finally, this is really for you. This is a, a sneak preview because uh, it's not yet on the website, uh, but uh, you can save the date already. There will be a workshop, uh, Clarin and Libraries, Interoperability of Text Platforms for Digital Libraries. And uh, you will be able to find more information and the registration uh, um, form online, but uh, for the time being, you can uh, actually save the date. Okay, and well, with this, uh, we first would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, once again, to ask if you have any questions and uh, you can uh, well, put them in the chat box or just unmute yourself. And uh, now I think Juliana would send uh, you the post-event survey uh, that we uh, have prepared and we kindly ask you to fill that in. And uh, of course, for the shock, uh, project. Uh, there are also Twitter account, uh, the website, the LinkedIn account, so you can follow the information of the workshop development uh, online. So at this point, if you have other questions or comments. If, of course, if you have some questions uh, afterwards, uh, we are happy to answer. You can send the, the, the questions to us. And uh, uh, those slides will be uh, available uh, later on. And uh, all, the, um, click, uh, all, all the links uh, will be there so that you can uh, check everything yourself. Uh, I'll just stop sharing then. So then we thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar, for uh, being here and listening to us. We are thankful for the, no for the comments that you have already provided. So we can uh, check with our colleagues whether they know about the data sets that you already have. And uh, um, for sure, we'll talk with the uh, teams that work on the workflows, how to make them, uh, yeah, this user friendliness, that's uh, our goal, of course. And of course, if uh, it's already has already been said <laughs> over and over again, if you have uh, um, any further requests or uh, you want to get in touch with Clarin for some specific uh, research uh, topics or uh, tools, uh, do not hesitate. Uh, sometimes, I mean, uh, I haven't cited another useful, I think I might just give you one last uh, uh, piece of information that is the Tour de Clarine. Uh, it is, uh, and you, you, some, there are, you, there are you, useful publications to discover not only what the central clearing services are, but also what the um, various uh, national centers offer, because there is so much more than what we have uh, said. So uh, you may also discover that there are uh, interesting services in your own country that uh, may be of interest to you. So this is also a useful reference uh, for you. Thanks also uh, from my part to, for attending and for all the interesting and useful feedback. Thank you very much for also for all the positive uh, feedback in the chat.
Wonderful. So th thanks, everyone. If we're ready, I think we can close this meeting. Many thanks for uh, being attentive and many thanks to our uh, hosts for uh, having this workshop. And we're looking forward to seeing you in our other Uber 2021 activities. And thanks to you, Athena. Thank you, Athena. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.